morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us for um, our third webinar of our Africa City Food Month 2022, um, centered around uh, a certain to city exchange, um, which really wants to sort of delve into uh, what, what does multi-level governance um, look like um, and how do we streamline that um, amongst um, the various partners um, that's, that's involved uh, with the governance of the food system. So um, we have an action-packed um, menu for you today um, and we're really excited um, to have uh, fruitful uh, discussions. Um, so as I mentioned, this is uh, Exchange from Spot of Africa City Food Month, um, which is in its third year. Uh, running, which is incredible. Um, and just a couple of house rules before we officially start um, the session. My name is Ryan Fisher. I'm a professional officer at ICLE Africa, um, and my work centers um, predominantly around um, assisting cities on the, on the urban food systems journey. And as I mentioned, this session forms part of, of um, our Africa City Food Month 2022, which um, focuses around um, nourishing our cities. Um, towards an on the road to recovery. So just before uh, the session begins, um, it's just important uh, for me to remind you all that uh, the session is being recorded and by um, participating, you are automatically consenting to being recorded. Uh, the recordings, of course, um, of the session uh, will be made available um, to all participants um, in addition to the key outcomes that will also be shared um, with all that those that have registered um, for the workshop. We do encourage you, of course, um, to participate. Um, two and a half hours goes, goes by so quickly, so I'm gonna try and be very strict with time. Um, please do engage with us um, using the chat. Uh, we will try to make it as interactive as possible, of course, um, which is always difficult because we have a limited amount of time, but we do encourage um, our participants to, to use the chat, um, to engage, to ask questions. And perhaps as a first point of call, it would be to, to please introduce yourself um, by sharing your name, your designation and your organization, and perhaps um, some thoughts um, around multi-level governance, um, perhaps how you're involved within the element of MLG um, and, and just any, any thoughts um, that, you, that you think is important for us to take the conversation forward. Um, I do want to stress um, that it is um, a must opportunity if you do not engage, I think, you know, the ethos of multi-level governance is, is collaboration um, and you never know who you, you, might, um, who you might meet uh, during the course of the session. So please do engage with us, ask questions um, and engage with our panelists um, as best possible. Um, as we dive in, um, as you can see on the screen, our, our conversation today um, centered around streamlining multi-level food system governance um, between national and, and, and local level governments. We do have um, a selection of, of panelists and speakers today that represents um, the continent at large. So um, we will head um, to West Africa in a bit when we hear from our colleagues from Bambilo. Um, we'll, we'll make a turn um, in South Africa as well. Um, and as we're being joined by our National Department of Agriculture, um, Rural Development and Land Reform. And of course, um, we'll hear um, some interventions from um, our east coastal city, Durban. Um, then we'll head um, offshore, so we'll, we'll head to, to the, the island of Madagascar. Um, we'll, we'll hear some, some interventions from, from the capital, the Antananarivo, and we'll have interventions from, from Nairobi as well. Um, we'll, we'll also hear some interventions from, from our partners, like our partners, the likes of GAIN and Africa Center for Cities, who of course plays an integral role um, in multi-level governance and, and looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Um, next slide, please. Just a little bit about ICLI and uh, perhaps more so to our new friends. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is in, we're in our third year of Africa City Food Month um, and there's some, there's some household names. If I just scroll through the participants list, uh, but also some new names that I haven't seen. And that is always encouraging that we, we, we're expanding the scope of our reach um, to those who we haven't engaged with and, and bringing um, new, fresh ideas into the conversation. Um, but just a little bit about who we are as ICLI. So um, we're the sort of driving force, I guess, behind Africa City Food Month um, with, with our partners, of course. 
but but we are we are membership based movement um, of local governments um, uh, committed to to ensuring a sustainable future for for their citizens. Um, we've been around um, for just over three decades now, and our network globally um, involves more than two thousand five hundred local and regional governments. Uh, which also includes uh, local government associations and uh, member states um, to a degree, committed, as I mentioned, to sustainable urban development. Um, We're active in what's probably now close to 130 um, countries globally um, and really driving towards a push um, to influence influence sustainable policy and and drive local action. our members and, and, and team of experts as well through the peer exchanges of which this is a prime example. Um, we really push the agenda of, of creating strong, meaningful partnerships, um, building the capacity of our of our, our, our member states, but also our, our partner cities, um, regions and towns. And of course, we do this through, through various lenses of low emission, nature based development, circular development, resilient development and equitable and people centered development pathways, which forms the backbone of, of everything that we do at ICLE. Um, if you do want to learn more, uh, please do follow the link in the chat um, or engage with any um, of myself and the ICLE team um, that's currently on the call. Africa City Food Month, next slide please. As I mentioned, we it's in the third year running and it's interesting to reflect back on when we had the first Africa City Food Month, which um, which was sort of in the heart of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a lot of us were, were under long, um, hard lockdowns. Um, and I think Africa City Food Month at the time really provided a space where we can um, sort of vent our, our frustrations around the sort of um, the uncertainty that, that, that there was at the time. Um, and I think now we find ourselves about two years down the line and really speaking about what is this recovery um, for our cities actually look like. And I think the ethos then of Africa City Food Month this year is, is then to reflect um, on the journey that cities are taking towards this recovery. I think um, in addition to, to the COVID-19 pandemic, I think in South Africa, for example, specifically, um, there's been um, the civil unrest, for example, last year. And of course, um, the, 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 the climate events of earlier this year, which has, which has rocked um, predominantly the eastern part of the country. So. Um, really important conversations around um, building that recovery um, and what um, that resilience um, of the food systems actually looked like. Building on the discussions um, from last year, and I think that has been a point um, well made in the beginning of this year through partners where um, it was emphasized that we can't be having the same conversations again. We need to we need to build on, for example, the outcomes from, from the, the Food System Summit last year. And I think this session around multi-level governance um, speaks really to, to one of the key outcomes there um, as, as, a, as, a, as a potential driving force towards um, spearheading the recovery of our cities. Um, and then, of course, I'm highlighting what, what these partnerships looks like, um, exploring governance processes and mechanisms, and then, of course, crafting um, actual tangible actions and priorities um, that our cities and partners can take forward um, towards the, the recovery. Just a, a glimpse into what's on the menu for today. Um, so action packed, we have a lot of intervention. Some will be delivered um, through PowerPoint. Some will just be verbal interventions. Um, but as a sort of pre-starter, uh, myself and and the manager of urban systems at Italy Africa, Mr. Paul Curry, will will try and sort of sort of set the scene um, with what I I term sort of pre-starter. Um, then we'll have three interventions from the Department of of Agricultural uh, Land Reform and Rural Development, um, Gain and Africa Centre for Cities, who will will try and sort of underpin and set the scene for multi-level governance, um, and then. The main course, I think, is, is going to be hearing from, from our cities um, and, and the approaches and challenges and opportunities as it relates to multi-level governance. Um, and then, of course, for dessert, we'll, we'll open up the floor and invite our panelists to, to perhaps touch on, on some of the outcomes from the discussions and, and, and some of the questions that arises from the participants. So again, I want to encourage all participants to please engage with us um, through the chat. Um, 
um, by asking questions um, or, or providing comments and, and feedback. Um, I think that will be much appreciated. It will add to the richness, of course, of the discussion. Um, and it will ensure, of course, that you that you um, uh, make the most of the of the of the session, and 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 of course that is the relevant outcomes for you then um, as takeaways to take further into your line of work. So that's what we have on the menu for today. Um, without wasting too much time, I want to hand over to Paul Curry um, for the pre-start just to 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 set the scene for us a little bit and, and contextualize why we're having this discussions today. So again, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us and yeah, hope you will enjoy the session with us. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Ryan, and hello, everybody. Um, I, I love the framing of the meal that we're about to have together. Uh, so I hope you have literally uh, uh, put aside some uh, snacks or at least a good drink uh, with you uh, for the session. Uh, my name is Paul Curry. I'm the Associate Director of the Urban Systems Unit at ICLEA Africa. Um, and I, I must say that these types of engagements are the reason that I love working with uh, ICLEA Africa. Uh, we've been working in the urban food system space for uh, a while. And I must say that most of what we've learned uh, about urban food systems has come from uh, local governments and uh, our partners working on food systems. So I think as a central role that ICLEA plays, uh, creating these spaces for learning between different types of actors um, is, is one of the things that we find incredibly important. Uh, Ryan and, and Ivan and the team we've organized today asked me to reflect a little bit on, on multi-level governance uh, and why we need it. And, you know, I think it starts with the, the framing of uh, uh, the need for vertical alignment and horizontal alignment. So when we think about multi-level governance, it's uh, looking uh, at different scales, we need to engage uh, with people who work at different scopes, so from community level, even the household level but below that, uh, looking at local, regional, national governments, uh, the thematic organizations who are working broadly on different themes um, uh, around sustainability or governance, um, and then the international NGOs and multilateral organizations. And so if we can align, so to speak, up the, the ladder of, of different scopes, uh, that's really important. Um, both to get a broad picture of what the world needs to do to change, but then also to think more contextually about what needs to happen in each specific community uh, or local area. And then horizontal alignment is really about working with different types of organizations, each of whom fulfill a really specific niche. So uh, working with local government who has a specific set of mandates, working with uh, civil society who bring the voice of uh, communities and people forward, um, working with private sector, uh, who are often the people driving our economy and actually moving food uh, through systems, um, and then working with uh, those who are bringing funding uh, and research uh, and ideas forward into the system. So all of this suggests that we must have clear lines of communication, a clear understanding of who must do what. We must align uh, the roles so that we avoid duplication. Uh, but we know that in practice, this isn't really clear. Uh, roles and responsibilities overlap. Uh, in sustainability, there can often be some naivety that everyone wants to achieve uh, the same goals. Uh, and that's not true. So, so multi-level governance must also be about uh, engaging with different tensions uh, between different interests. And something uh, we've been reflecting on uh, recently is uh, the role of decentralization. Uh, I think there's been a lot of movement, sorry, a hungry dog next to me. There's been a lot of movement around uh, African countries to decentralize powers and a lot of pushback about doing so. Uh, and something from one of our colleagues in the local government association in East Africa said that decentralization of powers is not about giving up power, but actually expanding your team. If more institutions and people are empowered to take on specific roles, then there are more hands to contribute to this work. Finally, to reflect on the role of intermediaries, uh, I think that's become something which has become more and more important in our work. Who are the people who are creating space for tough conversations or conversations that simply aren't happening? Who are the people who are bringing together different types of actors uh, to share the work that they're doing and to help with this al alignment work? So uh, this is a, an intermediary uh, space. 
uh, as always, I feel very privileged to learn from our, our speakers today and from the people who've joined us. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand you back into Ryan's hands to facilitate or, or guide us in this meal. Um, so thanks so much. Uh, and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, I think that sets us up quite nicely for um, our discussions that I think we'll We'll dive in maybe before we do, just a reminder, I should have done this in the beginning, just um, to let you know that there are, um, there's inter interpretation um, functionality on the call. So for um, our French uh, speaking participants, please do make use of the interpretation uh, function um, at the, on the taskbar um, at the bottom of your screen. If you do have any issues, um, please do let us know and we will try and sort you out um to the technical team on the back end but without further ado i want to welcome mr roger Tuckledo from the department of agriculture land reform and rural development um south africa um to share with us um just to start from from national um government's perspective um on on multi-level governance so mr roger um welcome and over to you Mr. Takalda, are you with us? Ah, yes, I, I was. I'm talking to myself here, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Because your no facial expression gave, told me, hey, something's not right here. What, what is wrong here? Um, good morning, everybody. I um, hope everybody's doing well. No, no problem. We are competing. Don't worry. Um, colleagues, um, those who don't know me, my name is Roger Takeldum. Um, I'm from the Department of Agriculture, um, Land Reform and Rural Development. Um, I'm from the National Department. I, I work in, in, in food security and agrarian reform, and, and I'm responsible for, for, for smallholder development. Um, and... Um, um, and, and today I'm, 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 I'm delightfully, um, I'm, I'm happy that I, I, I could share this, 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 this platform with you um, in, 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 in a way that we could um, 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 exchange ideas and, and really think about food systems. Um, Mr. Chair, if you, if you quickly move on. So what I will present, I will present um, what, what from a national point of view, we have been doing in terms of, of, of the food systems. Okay, there's just somebody that's not muted. Okay, cool. Um, I, I, I have the, 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 the esteemed privilege of, of representing um, South Africa at the United Nations, especially at the, at the CFS, which is the Committee for World Food Security, as well as other committees. And, and from, 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 from the United Nations um, work that, 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 that I am responsible for and food systems actually came through since 2016, not as, as prevalent as in the last couple of years, um, but, but from about 2015, 2016, um, at the United Nations level, we, food systems has been, has been coming through um, as, as a topic that needs to be addressed. Um, it, it, it's taken a lot of hard work at, 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 at the United Nations level, and especially for, country, for, for, for member states um, to deal with, with the issue of food systems because it was so strange, but we've managed to, 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 to come on board. Um, and so this slide particularly here that we have over here, it just gives us a, 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 a representation of what we have done so far in terms of, and, and, and when, I, when the, the team briefed me, um, it, it made a lot of sense um, to, 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 to speak about this. So we've had about about um, the national dialogue that we had um, and this started in earnest especially 2020 and we had national and then we had um, provincial uh, or, or, or sub sub national and and then 
we had at district level and we were very fortunate that we had a lot of participation at the lowest level at local municipality at district level had uh, participated um, 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 in these dialogues so in the national dialogues um, we, we had about almost a thousand people and at at, at, at the at the provincial level at the district level we had about two 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 thousand four hundred participants um, it is noted that, that that the district and provincial offices participated in groups using either one or two devices. So there's the actual number of, of uh, that could be much higher because in some instances we even had uh, where people organized themselves um, to be part of this. This is all just part of the background. Um, the dialogues convened under the leadership of the United Nations um, of the General Secretary or the Secretary General, um, is aimed at setting the scene, especially for global food systems transformation and recognizing the transformation of the food system is central to the world's efforts, um, which we seek to do in, in line with the SDGs of 2030. Um, action areas, um, the, the, the dialogues actually came up with five action areas, um, which has emerged um, primary areas to accelerate in order to deliver on the, the 2030 agenda. As well as the 2063, you'll see in my opening slide, I have the um, NEPAD and AU um, um, because we, we form part of those as well. So the, the, the five action areas, which is um, nourish to people, um, is boosting nature-based um, solutions for production, advance equitable livelihoods, um, decent work and empowered communities, and then building resilience to vulnerable shocks and stresses. And then number five is a means of implementation. So the United Nations outlined that the Food System Summit, um, and, and there was actually a, a, an international one which was on the sidelines of the, of the General Assembly, that will come later in my slide, um, but it's a catalytic movement, um, and, and, and why we also had it was for public mobilization and actionable commitments to the various stakeholders. Next slide. Um, so these these actions um, allowed us as, as, as to move into 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 various sections. Um, oh, yeah, it's moving on. Um, as 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 still, we we actually managed to identify coalitions, which included um, from 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 so so from these dialogues that we had, it metamorphosized into into coalitions which moved up into the national sphere, which moved into the, into the United Nations platforms. And for South Africa, from a national point of view, um, our coalitions that we identified that we will work on based on those five um, areas was um, actions for nutrition and zero hunger, um, school meals, food loss and waste, agroecology and sustainable livelihood and agricultural systems, the aquatics and, and blue foods, um, as well as living incomes and decent work, resilience, and then the, the means of implementation was looking at innovation, technology, data, and governance. Um, next slide, Mr. Chair. Um, so, so from a national point of view, what we've done is that we've actually managed to set the scene while having these dialogues. And so from last year, there's a process where these dialogues and, and, and the, the, the means of implementation has started gathering momentum not only at the national level, but moving down um, to a sub-national level. Um, and, and, and it was very important in terms of governance that um, we, we, we work, especially through the, the ISIT. The ISIT is the, economic, um, um, the economics cluster with, with, within government, in national government. So you have all the, the, the major role players, finance, and all of these people getting on board through the economic cluster. You have the international relations um, cluster that we've also presented to, and then within um, agriculture and then in the land reform space, it is the CEO's forum that we, we've actually, and these are the three, uh, those are three critical governance structures to make sure that from a national level to a sub-national level, information flows. Um, and we have decent information flow as well as what is the plans at the national level. So as I've mentioned before, um, at the, the United Nations General Assembly on the sidelines, um, South Africa, we were presented this by Minister or Dr. Naledi Pando who delivered um, the, 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 the commanding document, especially when it comes to food systems from a South African point of view. 
um, she, 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 she did on the sidelines. Although the president was supposed to deliver it, he couldn't deliver it. He was busy in Lusiki Siki at that day. Um, but it was, uh, but so Minister Pando actually delivered what we, what we would do at the national government level in terms of, 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 of food systems and the work that is enhanced. Um, Mr. Chair, my last slide, um, it, 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 it's basically the way forward and in what we've been doing. So South Africa's actually identified the four strategic um, actions to drive. Oh. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Um, so in summary, we've identified the, the four pathways in how we're going to do the food systems um, transformation. Um, and those four critical areas for us at the national level is an enhancement of sustainable local production for local consumption of safe and nutritious um, and indigenous foods, promotion of social, economic and environmental resilience, facilitation of inclusive and sustainable competitive value chains and the promotion of integrated food systems, policy, legislation, planning and governance. Um, Mr. Chair, I think that is the last slide, but I, I think I just want to end off by saying um, from a national point of view is that we, we have key and critical um, ways in which we, 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 we implement. And, and for, from a South African point of view, the nice thing is that our, our constitution, which is our guiding document, um, especially chapters four, five, um, six and seven, clearly um, spells out how our working relationship is. What is everybody's responsibilities, um, especially looking at the different, um, at the different spheres of, 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 of the way South Africa is structured, because we have a national, a provincial, and a local slash district um, um, view. But in, in South Africa, we, we also do know that we have a big part um, of, of, of our, of, 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 we've got about three um, really urban, urban centers, which is Cape Town, Gauteng, and, 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 and KZN, or Durban, or the Etiquini region. And then a lot of our, our other cities are secondary cities, as well as rural areas. But the way in which we work is, is, is so um, seamless at times. At times, it can be a constraint, but most of the times, it's, it's quite seamless because we, 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 we how we are structured um, as national and subnational um, governments, um, although centralized, we, we work in, in a very seamless way. So, so there's a lot of work that is done in terms of governance where national or the national department is not responsible for implementation, but our provincial and our district and local offices. But we work with them and provide a lot of oversight and a lot of coordination to those, to, 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 to our other role players, especially in the different, in the other spheres of, of, of government. Mr. Chair, let me leave it at that for now for, 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 for the food system. Suffice to say that food systems from a national to a sub-national level, it is complex, it's simple, um, but it, 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 it's only through, through, through working together um, and actually doing actual implementation that we could actually enhance and transform the, the, the food systems that we find ourselves in. Mr. Chair, um, with those few words, thank you very much um, for, 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 for allowing me to access this platform. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Tuckledo, and, and for indulging us. I think um, great insights, um, definitely, I think, promising to hear that um, things are moving sort of from from a conceptual phase um, into, into actual um, implementation. Um, I think it's, and you'll probably agree that it's by no means perfect. I think, as you said, um, it's complex. The whole sort of multi-level governance um, element is complex yet, yet simple. So uh, I think it's promising to hear, um, you know, some of those interventions actually trickling down to the sub-national district and local level. And, and perhaps um, a little bit later on when we hear from, from Etiquini, hopefully some of those um, strategic pathways, perhaps that you that you alluded to in your, you know, I think in your second last or your last slide, uh, will come through. Um, but again, thank you very much for for joining us, Roger. And um, yeah, we hopefully have some more discussions later on in the panel discussion. Um, yeah, maybe if we move on to to our second speaker, so Bain Kia from um, Gain Tanzania, who's um, a senior advisor of food system transformation 
Um, and again, it's a bit of a, of a of a switch, I guess, from from national government to to NGO level, if you like. But I think um, gain, of course, is quite instrumental, um, particularly in Tanzania, as they they spearheading this this beast of multi level governance. And I think um, they were obviously quite quite engaged um, in the independent dialogues in Tanzania last year. So, um, must be looking forward to to hearing a bit more of that process and those outcomes. And of course, I know you also as we speak in the midst of, of multi-level government engage, engagement. So um, please, please do indulge us. Over to you, Mr. Obe. Thank you, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I don't have a formal presentation, so to speak. Um, I will just give an overview of my our experience in um, multi stakeholder coordination and platforms. And of, of course, I'll do it from very quick background and the general experience. Then I'll come up to show the, our engagement pre-UNF summit and post-summit and what we are doing now. And finally, I'll offer a few, uh, you know, takeaways um, on really what should be done to make this platform work. So. Coming from government before uh, joining GAIN, I was uh, sitting in the coordination of uh, our, co our art sector end of the day. And I happened to sit in one of them. I was the secretary for eight years coordinating committee on nutrition, which consisted of uh, government, uh, development partners, CSO, private sector, academia, there to advance the uh, much sexual uh, response to nutrition in Tanzania. And I saw really much uh, sexual, much partnership, much stakeholders platform can work when we put our interest together. So that's a personal experience uh, I had. But at GAIN, I think uh, what I found also, they have a very good experience in um, convening and putting uh, uh, stakeholders together. For example, GAIN has been the um, convener of uh, SAN Scaling Up uh, Nutrition Business new Network, which puts together the business and also come into uh, engaging with the government and others in advancing the, uh, the nutrition agenda. So I saw it as a platform whereby they could sit together and how do we bring the good nutrition in the market? In fact, is to bring the private sector more responsible in the food system. But I think uh, last year through um, our project of keeping food market work in Tanzania during the COVID, we supported the construction of um, uh, really upgrading of infrastructure in one of the urban market in Dar es Salaam. So it was a short time project, um, but it was possible because of putting all the actors together. We put the government, local government together, the market association, the traders together, you know, push out, to, we, we work together to make that happen. So to me, those experiences are important, but also we supported one thing, the deepening nutrition governance uh, within the city, whereby we were supporting the city in really um, making the nutrition work. But in terms of the um, uh, food system dialogues uh, last year, I'll put it in two ways, a pre-UN summit and post-UN summit. And the pre-summit, um, we were given the privilege by the government to really facilitate all the mass sectoral dialogues. And we, in total, we did 12 dialogues, some of them private, and two of them in particular were city dialogues, one in Dodoma and the other one in Arusha. We, we, we happened to facilitate uh, all of them. Um, and to me, uh, really, we brought together what we thought they are key and important stakeholders in the room, including the you know um, traders, um, restaurant owners, transporters, you know the government itself, and other um, CSOs around the, uh, those two cities, and sat together, discussed a lot of issues. A lot of issues came out. You could see how powerful. The, that, that, that kind of uh, stakeholders uh, intervention is. The issue of safety from production, the issue of uh, you know, safety from storage point of view, the issues of uh, you know, taxes and fees, 
the issues of areas of these food vendors, where, where will they sit together to sell and nutritious and sell food, for example? So all those arguments were coming very well from all these brief stakeholders. But we brought also producers from other outside of these cities, because our, our cities, most of us are consumers. The urban agriculture cannot feed all of us. So all those producers from uh, where the, the food is produced and brought to the city was really where part and parcel of these uh, uh, discussions. And to me, really, discussions were, were good. And um, what I could say is could see the power of these uh, stakeholders being together and uh, advance the uh, food system agenda. Of course, um, after that we, is when we all the, putting together all the, 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 the dialogues, came up with the pathways which the government, the convener is leading all of us to make sure they are implemented. So what next after that? After the summit, we also held two much set stakeholders, uh, you know, um, engagements. Uh, one, of course, we included Zanzibar, semi-autonomous uh, um, Zanzibar, where it's really most urban, and they have their unique um, unique features in the food system, seeing how, for example, the fishery is high there compared to mainland where it's more of the fishery is there, but Zanzibar is more prominent. So we included it. So post summit, we have held to, we held to a meeting, first of all, to give the feedback to stakeholders who we took the ideas when we were do, conducting the dialogues and give them the pathway which we came up with and the plan of action and now we are going to support its implementation. So we did one in Arusha where we brought again the, the, the entire stakeholders from the map of the, the food system and shared with them. And the other one in Zanzibar as well where we, we sat with them and we strategized the way forward in terms of um, implementation. So we, we thought that was necessary uh, because most of us sometimes we go to partners, take the ideas, do the pilot, and we never go back to tell them what was working. So that was good feedback to all the stakeholders uh, we are working with. Now, what we have been doing over the past two weeks or three is we are implementing a small project with UNEP of really, um, which has main three component. One is to carry out another good assessment of the food system in Tanzania, but that one is in the context of sustainable production and um, consumption. Of course, putting the issue of uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity protection at core front in the, in the food system. So that's the first component. The second component, we are going to establish multi sectoral multi partnership platforms uh, especially in the cities, which will really be sustainable to oversee the food system uh, in those cities and be the learning ground for other local government authorities to do. And the third component is sustainable food uh, system platform development of the sustainable food action plan. So we, we have had, held the meeting, one in Zanzibar, 10 days ago, where we really did a lot of ideas. And Establish, you know, an area or created mechanism for establishing a platform in Zanzibar, which will include CSO, UN, and so on. Then, now, as I'm talking, I'm in Arusha. We had, we had another meeting for three days where we are discussing with uh, stakeholders again these platforms. But in Arusha, there is a platform which is existing. So what we are doing is to complement the effort there, work with them, uh, strengthen it, and be really as the platform where others can come to learn. And we learn a natural platform at national level, which will oversee the issue of national. Um, so I think we are we are good to go, and we we will finally come out with the action plan to 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 to, to implement those uh, uh, pathways. So to me, let me very quickly finalize by giving a few lessons or a few things I have learned through this um, engagement. One, really in any platform in any multi-sectoral, let the government be part of it because what we are doing, we are supporting the policy implementation or formulation a certain policy. 
anyway. So the government should really be uh, there to be part and parcel of it. So the second thing which I think is important as we, we, we talk about stakeholder, know what other partners are doing to avoid duplication. You know, call them together. So these platforms are the ones which makes you to understand, know your partners well. What are they doing? What can we complement? How do we avoid the duplication? Because we have always gone to the stakeholders, especially to the government or to the people we are targeting differently in the silos and frustrate them at times. So know what your partners are doing. Give back to the partners wherever you are together in the platform. When you, 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 you are with them, you take the idea of implement, where we are implementing the, give them the idea, the platform with the ideas. The, the, our feedback is one, two, three, four, five, and let the, them hear what you are doing. And to me, my partnership platform minimizes unnecessary petty competitions, you know, because, you know, you, you know what you are doing. You, 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 in the partnership platform, you can know what is this one doing. Let me compliment here. Let's advance our agenda. Let's make it big so we don't compete, but rather complementing each other. So these platforms are, are really important uh, in those. So those are a few lessons I have learned. And I think I'll stop here and uh, um, let others also continue and I'll wait for any uh, reaction. Thank you. Thank you, Obey. I, I agree. Maybe, maybe save some for for our dessert session a little bit later on when we when the panel convenes but thank you for those insights i think um yeah there's some some good lessons there um maybe one that i took out was that i think multi-level governance is a continued process and i think particularly where we are at the moment on the back of you know for example the the independent dialogues last year um, a lot of the times you know we have these very important engagements and then we lose momentum for for, for whatever reason. And, and, and I think that then sort of hampers um, the entire progress. So it's really, it's really encouraging to, to see and really through the through sort of coordination from GAIN um, that is, there's existing momentum and there's plans um, to also sort of craft um, an actual in-depth action plan for taking um, these outcomes and pathways forward. So thank you, Mr. Obey, for, for indulging us and, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll hear some more of your insights a little bit later on. As we move on, I think as we close our, our starter session, um, I think we'll close it in style with, with Mr. Gareth Haysom, um, who's a researcher at the Africa Center for Cities and, and um, also one of the household names. Gareth has been, been walking this, um, this journey with us over the last couple of years um, and providing really important insights um, on the back of various projects and interventions, um, but also looking at, at sort of, you know, some of those tangible research outcomes um, that's not always the easiest, I think, to, to transcend or to, to get into actual action on the ground in our city. So, um, Gareth, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And um, yeah, we look forward to, to your intervention. Thank you so much, right? <clears throat> I always get a bit nervous when I refer to it as a household name. It could be a good or a bad thing. So anyway, but I'm going to perhaps be a bit more provocative. And I think building on some of the introductory comments that were, that were made and and, and Paul, your, your post in the, in the chat about the role of multi-level governance and, and this kind of, I want to ask questions, are we actually clear about the roles and responsibilities of the different actors at the different tiers and across the different spaces? So I'm going to try and provoke some ideas around that. If I just want to acknowledge that a lot of this work that I'll present is kind of embedded in work that we've done across the continent and in many different cities. So I just want to acknowledge the researchers and the members of the communities and those that have worked with us to provide this information. Next slide, please, Alan. So very briefly, I'm just going to provide a brief background and, and perhaps, and I'll run through it very quickly, uh, just to sort of reframe, just to ask a question about how we frame food security as and nutrition security but also just to engage in the urbanization profile across the continent and to try and raise this point of the, the centrality being African City Food Month of African cities and their food systems. And then just to highlight some of the state of food insecurity and what that might mean and ask questions about resilience and what we say and these terms we use. And then I just want to speak a little bit about the sort of the role of transversal governance and what multi-level governance might mean and, and to kind of try and reframe that. So next slide, please, Ivan. 
So really for me, I think what we often sit with is this framing of food security. And it's useful. Many of you work in the food security space, so forgive me if this is a bit patronizing and I'm being a lecturer asking the questions. But in our work, if one, uh, Ryan, if you can just move on, uh, what I often encounter is the, the thanks, the framing of food security often is still embedded in that 1975 framing of food security by producing more. And because of that, what we have is this focus on availability with a secondary component to that being access. And we often miss with less a focus on utilization and stability and often utilization is relegated to the, the sort of the department of health about nutrition etc and the focus sits at this national government and how national government is about sort of national food security i was in a session yesterday where we said you know we are nationally food secure but we have high levels of food insecurity and i apologize the slide seems to have been a bit scrambled here but often sort of the sdgs and others the CG groups, the consultative groups often drive this sort of national focused agenda. Often the national governments then relegate this kind of process down to sort of district or kind of county or, 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 or sort of provincial governments, but the focus remains the same. It's very rural, it's about production, it's about support. And the urban space is often missed in this space. And when the urban engages, it's through urban agriculture, but it's largely through projects. But for me, most importantly, in this sort of framing and this kind of way in which it's embedded, this hierarchy of food security means that fiscal allocation is very seldom allocated to cities. So what we see is great work happening in cities, but very little budgets. And I want just really to ask that question. So how do we engage in transversal governments when the playing field is perhaps a bit skewed? Next slide, please. So what I want to ask is building on the more recent sort of definition of food security about availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability, the high level panel of experts have sort of reframed food security. So we too need two additional dimensions, agency and sustainability. And one can read through the slide here, but for me, what is most important in this is as part of that framing, the argument that if there is a hierarchy of food security and how we frame it in a hierarchical way, it's actually not going to achieve food security. We need to see each of these dimensions of food security as being equally important to the achievement of food security. And I raise this because you can go to the next slide, please. This has a particularly important role in the urban space. And so very briefly, what we are dealing with in the African continent is not a framing and understanding of urbanization that we draw from the European context. It took 200 years for European countries and North American countries to urbanize. And most of the resources that supported that urbanization came from Africa and the global South anyway. Africa itself is urbanizing incredibly rapidly, but across the global South, we're gonna achieve 50% urbanization in a period of about 80 years, whereas Europe took, and North America took about 200 years to achieve that. Our urbanization will arrive at an urban population of about 4 billion people. That's very different to the sort of half a, mil, half a billion people that was in global north. So the pace and the scale of that urbanization is profound. And so my question is, is that hierarchy of food security, is if we are going to be a predominantly urban continent by 2030, what does that mean? Next slide, please. And so here is just a, another way of making that same point, that already we have about a third of the sort of African continent, and Africa is not a country, so it, it, the sort of urbanization profile differs across the continent. About a third of the continent is already over 50% urbanized. By 2030, the other, the second third will be urbanized as well. And we already have in around 2018 from the UN report, or UN DESA, over half a billion people living in cities. And is this focus on production only? Is this, is this kind of dominance of national government programming and growing more food really going to serve a predominantly urban continent? And what does that mean for nutrition? What does that mean for a child conceived today growing up in a slum, Kibera or whatever, to use the more dominant names? What does that mean for that child in this particular framing of food security and our particular approach to food security? Next slide, please, Ivan. It's also not to say that every city is the same. So we have a very different profile across the city. So we have these very different size and scale of cities. So we have these 
intermediary towns and cities, secondary towns, tertiary towns, whatever terms we want to use it. And James here has you know, framed this in other ways and others have framed it in interesting ways. But it's really just to say that it's not to see every city as the same. So this isn't about arguing for a blueprint that focuses now on, on cities in Africa. How do we deal with the contextual realities of every different city? Next slide, please. And so what I argue is we have the primary cities, but then we also have cities that are here for very different reasons. Some might be administrative centers. You talk about Arusha, which is a tourism and administrative point potentially, in my sort of somewhat naive framing of this. Bambilo might be a kind of sort of a largely rural area that's urbanizing rapidly. We have all these very different types of cities. We have a Kasumu city or someone that sits on a corridor that sits between a connection between the Great Lakes and the coastal areas. Um, and very different types of towns and cities. So again, context is also important and informs that. Next slide, please, Owen. Just to use this African case, you know, we have a country that is six, almost 70% urban at this point in time. Um, and yet we still have this dominant sort of focus on, 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 on a rural sort of production. Not only that, of the urban population in the country, about you know, a large proportion of that sits in six large metros, and then we have a secondary town. So again, that difference, but equally in the Western Cape where I'm in base at this point in time, the province is 90% urbanized. So is it right that there is very little mandate and very little fiscal allocation provided to the cities in that area? And what does that mean for transversal government? How is power assigned if power comes through fiscal allocations? It comes through policy that is directed from national government. What does that mean for how we engage in transversal government at the urban space. Next slide, please. And just to reflect on the state of food insecurity, I would argue that a lot of this absent mandate and a lot of this absent focus and a lot of the absent allocation and, and that sort of misdirected focus has meant that a lot of our city residents have very poor levels of food insecurity. We often assume that food insecurity is high in the rural areas, but it's equally high in the, in the urban areas. And as one can see here, across just the snapshot of seven cities where we've done some work, that there are extremely high levels of severe and moderate food insecurity, almost over 50% in every one of these. Vintuk and Kitwe are higher, but that's because the surveys were done in predominantly poor areas. But equally, the dietary diversity scores, where six is often an indicator of potential for undernutrition, many are at six or lower. And just to point out that all these surveys were done before the pandemic. So now after COVID and the contraction of the global and national economies and the urban economies, these figures are potentially far higher than that. Next slide, please. The challenge that we face is that there is food. There's a lot of food in the cities of all different types. Next slide, please. The, and this food is available through multiple different areas and different sources. And so what is often missing is how we connect food to other urban mandates, urban things that happen that also enable transversal governments. So next slide, please. So how do we think about spatial planning and urban planning? How do we think about physical planning, land use planning, and how governance is planned? And so how do we think through these different areas? Because these are some of the components that dictate food security. Next slide, please. And so the street often becomes the stove when people live in high levels of informality and things like that. And there is a risk. Next slide, please. If your child is coming home from school and you live in a landy in somewhere in Kenya, you don't want the child to be starting a fire to make themselves lunch. You'll give them cash to buy street food. So this then is also part of what drives urban food security. And so it is a strategic choice, not a naive choice, not ignorance. It's about saying, how do I make sure my child is safe in the landy? and give them food, they might eat fried chips. And what does that mean for the nutrition component? And if there is only a focus on growing food as a food security response, rather than thinking of the urban condition, what does that mean and how does that make, make this work? Next slide, please. So I would argue that unlike policy programs at the national scales and even how some of the targets in the SDGs are framed and even in the Habitat 3 and in many ways, some of the framings of the Agenda 2063. At the urban scale, there are very different factors that influence food security. And these enable a very different type of transversal governance, but also ask for very different understandings of what the food security mandate needs to be at an urban scale compared to elsewhere. Next slide, please. 
So it's not just about energy and types of things. This is a more rural settlement. It's about waste. It's about access to water, access to sanitation. It's about what fuels are being used to cook food. Next slide, please. And so all these then start to come together in how we start to understand cities. Given that urban trajectory, this quote from a colleague of mine is also for me particularly important because the next two decades are really going to determine how Africa develops. And there's going to be massive investment in infrastructure and massive investment in both rural, as we see in sort of the large infrastructure programs, but equally in urban areas. And if the infrastructure that we're investing in perpetuates path dependencies of a past kind of approach to things, we are really going to be trying to operate and go, trying to see Africa rise with both our hands tied behind our backs. So we really need to understand the urban transition as a driver of the continental transition and what that means for infrastructure and what that means for the future food systems is a critically important question. And what, how we engage transversal governance in this context is also important. Next slide, please. So for me, the urban system operates in quite a different way where we see the particular site and we need to see the connections between social services, the social system, the health system, the, the sort of food system and the urban system all connecting. But equally how we manage across those particular areas at a horizontal level, but equally how we manage, at a, at a, how we manage at a vertical level across the different frames of governance. And it's only when we can start to understand these processes that we start to see, I would argue, that we start to see real transversal governance playing out. Next slide, please. So hopefully this isn't garbled as well. It is, so my apologies, but I want to reframe that conversation where the power sat with national government, which was sort of delegated down to others and a sort of lower sort of mode in the current mode to a transversal mode where we see all spheres kind of understanding their roles in food governance, understanding their roles in multi-level governance, each having different areas of focus that are attuned to their specific needs, but each having kind of key fiscal allocations and, and actually really and of being able to support, just if one can move on, where given our urban transition, um, that it's actually about sort of the needs of the urban focusing and shifting up and making far greater demands of provincial, district, county, and national, rather than the other way. And it's the support coming down to enable these actions. And it's when we have those kind of processes playing out that we start to see a more transversal kind of governance playing out where we are able to kind of balance the horizontal needs across multiple departmental functions and the vertical needs across others as well. Next slide, please. And I think for me, it's also about understanding scale and understanding that we still need to look at the capabilities. We still need to focus at the neighborhood. We need to focus at the city and the regional scale and how we start to understand, as Roger said, this new focus on food systems how we understand the entire system and not just a single component of that being production or others. And then to the last slide, just as a closing, just to make a point that I think if we look at the, the climate challenge and the issues that we're facing at the moment that are predominantly in the news today, that it's the food system and the urban system that are going to be the primary drivers of the climate, the challenges we face. We, we don't have a plan B. And so we have to focus on these areas in order to try and make sure that we're able to realign a whole set of areas, because this is where the solutions lie to a wider set of processes. And thank you, Ryan. I see you've come back on the screen. So I'll end there. And, and if there are any comments or disagreements, I'd be great to hear those. So thank you. Me end there. Thanks, Gareth. I think I can, I can hear the, the, the question marks and some light bulbs going off um, with the participants. So hopefully, some of those um, will be shared with us during the, the panel discussion. But yeah, great insights. Um, a bit more questions for ourselves to ask. I think, um, yeah, vertical vertical alignment integration is um, is probably the way to go um, in sort of letting the local context, I guess, um, inform um, our food system strategies. Um, and I think that's quite an important point to make. And hopefully some of that will will come through in, in our next round, um, which is our, our main course, which um, we'll be hearing from our cities. Um, so hopefully some of, some of the, the issues and elements that was presented in the starter session um, will hopefully be, be evident um, 
yeah, as, as, as we as we head into our, our main course. So without um, wasting too much time, I want to call upon our colleague from the Nairobi County, Mr. Patrick. Hello. Hello. Hi, Patrick. Uh, Patrick is... Uh, yeah, the way we see it. Sound great, Patrick. If you if you could tilt your 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 camera just slightly down so that we can we can see you a bit clearer. Is that better? Go. That's brilliant. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll take you through a series of uh, some uh, slides uh, about uh, nourishing our cities towards equitable recovery, and I'll be focusing more or less on the Nairobi Food uh, System Strategy, uh, the one that we have taken. Uh, uh, through uh, through the past few months. And uh, this is what I'm going to speak about. Next, please. Yeah, so the layout of uh, my presentation will be about the food policies of Kenya, then Nairobi City County Food System uh, Strategy, then a bit of uh, a stakeholder involvement. Some people will refer to it as uh, partners, and then uh, some of the implementation activities that we are taking. Next, please. Uh, we basically, we have a, 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 in our country, we basically uh, anchor all our activities from the national uh, uh, policies. And we had of the Kenya Vision 2030 policy, uh, that one of making a new industrialized uh, middle income and country providing a high quality of life. And there are a number of things that are to be done among that. One of them being increasing agricultural productivity, increasing uh, market access, uh, as well as uh, strengthening producer organizations. Next. Uh, another one is on the national food and nutritional security uh, uh, policy. And uh, this one again is also a very important policy, especially for our, uh, for our city. Uh, in that uh, first and foremost, it looks at uh, increasing uh, both the quantity and the quality of food available, uh, issues on uh, food safety, uh, issues of uh, achieving uh, good nutrition, as well as uh, availing the same in, uh, in a timely version, as well as uh, protecting the vulnerable populations, as I probably put so well by the area speaker, Mr. Gareth. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, we also have uh, the supreme law in Kenya, and this is the constitution of Kenya. And uh, to be specific uh, on article number 43, part one, it says that the government shall give every person the right to health, freedom from hunger, and access to adequate and safe food. So uh, next, please. So it's on this background uh, that uh, we have the Nairobi City County Food uh, System Strategy. And uh, its uh, uh, main objectives are actually mirrored on from uh, the, uh, the issues that come from uh, the national policy. So that one of increasing uh, food uh, production, uh, that one about uh, uh, stable food supplies, basically about access. And uh, as, uh, of course, people access, you also have the issues of uh, f uh, reducing a food loss. You can also add a uh, waste. And of course, at the very end of the value chains, we have the consumers. So you're also looking at the good way of your food consumers. Next, please. Uh, then uh, uh, we more or less uh, try to use the, uh, the system approach. And here we basically talking about uh, how food moves from the field to the fork. Other people from another school of thought would talk about from uh, farm to fork and basically, uh, this is the approach that we have used for the sector. And in that uh, uh, illustration there, you can uh, uh, clearly see the different uh, stakeholders uh, who are there, uh, who are involved right from the farmers on one end up to the customers at the other end. And we have the, uh, both the supply side and also the demand side. So it's like uh, we are providing or uh, using the system approach uh, you are providing a uh, food according to the demand. Next, please. Uh, and this is a basic, uh, uh, ex uh, rather, explanation about sustainable food systems, uh, where basically you are more or less looking at uh, the current and future generations, how they can be food secure, how they um, 
how we can uh, have uh, them eating healthy diets. And there is also the second element about sustainability. You cannot really talk about a food system if you're not talk, looking at sustainability. What technologies are you going to use? Uh, are they sustainable? Uh, what, um, uh, are they using uh, uh, resources as uh, efficiently? So th those are issues uh, uh, about uh, that. Next, please. Uh, we also, <clears throat> again, uh, look uh, again at food system from uh, uh, the HRPE uh, point of view. And uh, uh, again, uh, uh, in this school of uh, thought, uh, they look at uh, uh, the food system as comprising elements uh, the, the, that, uh, and uh, activities that are around production, processing, distribution, and preparation as well as the consumption of food. And uh, therefore, they are looking at also the socioeconomic and environmental outcomes. Uh, so the, that's uh, one of the definitions that we really looked at, uh, or we really thought about when uh, we are going through our uh, food uh, strategy. Next, please. Uh, still, uh, from another point of view on sustainable food systems, uh, talking about uh, 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 systems that deliver food security, and nutrition uh, in a way that uh, meets the economic, social, and environmental basis. And again, I think uh, Gareth has really talked about uh, 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 the issues around uh, production, uh, uh, especially in vulnerable areas. He quoted the area of Kibera, uh, and uh, uh, we are going to see it further down. Thank you. Uh, let's move next. Uh, as we moved through the strategy, uh, one of the most important things is that uh, uh, in a strategy, we thought of the institutions uh, that would be involved uh, in uh, delivering the strategy. And we thought about the various functions that uh, uh, the various institutions would, uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would be doing. And one of them is the food board. And this one is basically giving directions, talking about the policies involved around uh, uh, waste management, food recovery, uh, subsidizing food, all those uh, issues on policy that would be handled by the food board. Uh, then uh, we have uh, what uh, we refer to as a, a frag, and uh, this is a uh, uh, basically uh, a body that is put up whereby they bring new ideas and you're going to see uh, later on. Uh, but ideally what you're saying is that uh, they look at the problems and they advise on the decisions to be made. Then uh, we also note that in Nairobi, for instance, uh, uh, we have different sectors. We have agriculture, we have uh, uh, the uh, the people who are dealing with the waste, we are dealing with others who are dealing with traffic and all that. And all of them have even health and education. They are all different sectors. And uh, there needs to be uh, a committee uh, that brings in or that loops in the food aspect in each of, the, of those sectors. So you have the joint committee for that. Then uh, lastly, we have the intergovernmental uh, committee. And uh, this is to note that uh, we have the national government and we also have the county government. Uh, Nairobi is one of the 47 counties in Kenya. And therefore uh, we need to cascade uh, the decisions that are made at the national government at, at the county government. So we also have uh, that uh, uh, institution that rings the two. Next, please. Uh, then uh, uh, this one is now again uh, the frag. Uh, uh, this one is uh, an advisory, a food uh, liaison advisory group. It's a private sector red institution and its functions, I had said, were to have new ideas, to have new actions, new partnerships. And it's uh, simply a, a kind of aerobic group uh, that sees uh, what is not working and uh, tells uh, uh, the government to, uh, or points out, uh, what can work. So in essentially, uh, it assures efficiency and sustainability of our Nairobi city food system. And again, just to put it uh, clearly is that uh, we have with this body, we had a meeting and uh, uh, they even had uh, some uh, interim officials and uh, it, uh, it has basically started working, uh, though it is not yet a food brew. Next, please. 
Uh, then uh, we have a stakeholder involvement. And here we have involved uh, various uh, stakeholders along the value chain or various value chains. Uh, this includes the input suppliers, the farmers, producers. We also have distributors, processors, as well as consumers. Uh, we also note that uh, uh, at the beginning of our of our, of our coming up with the strategy, we involved the researchers and extension agents. Agents. We also had enumerators who went down to collect data, and as well as policymakers, so they were part of the package. So uh, ideally, uh, as we went through the strategy. We brought in the various stakeholders at various stages, uh, either of the strategy development or the strategy implementation, as we are going to see further. Next, please. Uh, then uh, uh, here comes the, or just a summary of the Nairobi Food System Governance Journey. Uh, essentially, we started down in 2018. And here we had the idea about the urban food systems that came up uh, during the FAO project that was being referred to as developing sustainable food system for urban areas. We also had a second study on rapid urban food system appraisal tool. And it's from these two, uh, to the results of these two studies that we came up with the first draft uh, uh, in 2019, and uh, these uh, drafts, they were supported by FAO. We also had the C40 cities uh, uh, and, and the NGO uh, that gave uh, financial as well as technical support uh, of coming up with the same. Next, please. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, still continuing with the timelines, in 2019, we had internal consultations with the, the other city departments. I had, I had said that we have education, we have health, we have agriculture, we have forestry, we have the, even a traffic department. We had some internal consultations. And uh, as we had those consultations, uh, we came up with that draft after which uh, we further consulted with the FAO on the implementation plan. And in, again, in 2020, we had a validation workshop uh, with the key stakeholders where we ended up with a draft form. Uh, then uh, uh, in 2021, at the peak of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, we had to do some public particip participation, which we held uh, because we, uh, through the newspapers, uh, because we could not hold physical meetings. Then uh, uh, earlier this year, the final document was processed and approved. Next, please. Uh, next, okay. Then uh, we have uh, the food technologies uh, as we start to implement. We have the food technology technolo uh, technologies as some of them, uh, you can see them from uh, Kibra. Uh, uh, next, please. Next. And again, these are some of the uh, technologies again that uh, we had with our stakeholders. And uh, we are almost through now. The next one, but almost the last one. Uh, we are also having several trainings and advocacy. And uh, this is now part of the implementation. And I think this is the bit that we have gone. In the last section there, you can see there is a, a, a break that is uh, showing us uh, some of the advocacy issues. And then on the last bit uh, is that uh, we also dealing with the food waste recovery and processing. So thank you uh, so much for our reasoning. Santi. Santi Sana, Mr. Patrick. Um, thank you for sharing that. Always very inspiring. Um, I think process for for crafting the the strategy, and um, I think particularly the, the 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 element around the flag, the flag committee, um, and what it aims to achieve. And um, I think um, with that, hopefully, um, with the, with the Patrick's um, intervention, sparks um, some inspiration, I guess, and uh, some of our other cities. Um, and of course, if there are any specific questions. Um, or comments that you would like to direct um, to Patrick, please feel free to do so. Um, we're going to head a little bit more south of Nairobi towards uh, Durban. Um, and we'll hear from Mr. Eric Applegren, who's the head of international 
um, and governs relations at the city. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, the city's food systems, um, government's approach. Um, yeah, and of course, we also know Durban has, has experienced a whole lot of shocks recently to, to its food system. So i um, looking forward to, to the intervention from Eric and, and hopefully how the, the rest of the panel um, and the session can, can perhaps, you know, work towards supporting the city um, in this endeavor. So Eric, welcome and um, over to you. Is Eric still with us? Ryan, I did see that he posted a message that he had to urgently leave um, to another engagement. So if, if I'm not sure if he has come back. Um, uh, okay, I don't uh, see him on. I see a message from uh, Teresa Sabin. Um, I'm not sure, Teresa, if you've um, been roped in to provide an intervention on, on behalf of Eric. Um, if not, then we should probably move on in the interest of time. Uh, actually, no, I haven't been uh, out to present any stuff on his behalf. I think he's been called away to mayor's office at the moment. Okay. And any indication if he will be rejoining us, Teresa? Yes, he said he will try later on to rejoin. It was okay. just an urgent call. Great. Completely understood. I think we'll we'll move on then to to the next speaker, um, Ivan, and I'll call on Mr. Nome Randria Manantena from uh, the city of Antanarivo, which is the capital of, of Madagascar, um, to share a little bit. And I think um, probably a similar journey to Nairobi. I know the city of Antana last year during the, the independent dialogues process um, presented their, their draft strategy to, to um, the relevant stakeholders. So. Uh, Mr. Norme, looking forward to, to hearing your intervention. And just a reminder to, to um, those listening in on English, I think Mr. Norme is going to present in, in French. So please make use of the interpretation function um, on the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. There should be interpretation from French to English. Um, that should be quite seamless. And with that, Mr. Norme, over to you. Euh, merci beaucoup, Ryan, euh, pour euh, cet temps de parole. Merci à tous les organisateurs euh, de cette euh, plateforme d'échange. Salutations aussi à tous les panélistes ici présents. Et bonjour aussi à tous ceux qui nous suivent de par le monde pour cette euh, séance de partage d'expérience sur euh, la gouvernance du euh, système alimentaire urbain. La ville d'Antananarivo est euh, euh, la capitale de, de Madagascar avec quelques 85 km² de superficie qui agglutine à elle seule hein, presque 2 millions d'habitants et qui doit faire face à de très nombreux aléas sociaux, économiques, environnementaux comme ce contexte qui est tant bénéfique pour elle sur ses forces que sur ses faiblesses. Une population euh, en perpétuelle expansion avec euh, un taux de croissance de 3% annuel, qui, et cela, s'ajoute à un mouvement migratoire permanent et supplémentaire de plus de, <coughs> pardon, de 100 000 habitants par an. Donc, pour garantir la sécurité alimentaire pour toutes ces populations, euh, surtout pour euh, les groupes les plus vulnérables, devient une nécessité et une priorité sur euh, la politique de gouvernance euh, pour parvenir à des systèmes alimentaires inclusifs et nourrissants, pour euh, renforcer euh, la résilience tout en favorisant la génération, euh, régénération de l'environnement. Donc, pour cette politique alimentaire, nous avons eu euh, le privilège d'avoir l'appui précieux de la FAO, euh, qui est le mieux placé hein, de par ses expériences pays, de par, de par le monde, sur cette politique alimentaire urbaine et qui était à son tour de solliciter tous les parties prenantes susceptibles d'apporter des, des solutions pour établir les axes stratégiques pour avancer ensemble. Nous avons élaboré avec l'équipe de la FAO une politique à travers le projet SARU, le système alimentaire des, des régions urbaines, 
une politique qui se veut être inclusif. Donc, la stratégie était de, de consolider une mode de gouvernance participative et bien considérer toutes les parties prenantes de l'ensemble des, des chaînes de valeur de la filière alimentaire plus durable, euh, commençant par l'État et euh, le gouvernement par ses ministères centraux, comme le ministère de l'Agriculture et de l'Élevage, le ministère de l'Industrialisation et du Commerce, de la Consommation, de l'Environnement, euh, de la Population, et etc., de l'aménagement du territoire. Mais il y a aussi les collectivités euh, territoriales décentralisées comme euh, la ville d'Antananarive, ainsi que les villes euh, limitrophes euh, pour euh, organiser ensemble cette stratégie. Et il y a aussi les élus locaux au sein de l'Assemblée nationale euh, pour les textes réglementaires. Il y a les associations, les ONG euh, œuvrant dans la filière euh, agriculture. Et il y a aussi euh, certainement les agriculteurs et les producteurs locaux. Donc cette politique de gouvernance a été euh, axée sur le fait tout d'abord d'instaurer euh, un task force, de nominer un point focal au sein de chaque acteur de l'ensemble du, du système multisectoriel avec les élus pour rédiger, proposer et surtout d'adopter des textes réglementaires concernant les axes prioritaires de la politique pour bien assurer la continuité de l'effort car les dirigeants changent, hein. mais ce euh, comité de pilotage ne doit pas être nominatif, mais ça va assurer la représentativité euh, permanente des entités concernées. Donc, nous avons euh, repéré euh, six principaux enjeux pour les, les politiques alimentaires urbaines, qui sont la gouvernance, comme on a dit, il y a aussi le système de production, le système de transformation, de distribution, le système de commercialisation ainsi que le système de, de gestion euh, rationnelle des déchets. Donc pour cette gouvernance, euh, nous aimerons partager euh, l'expérience un peu de la ville d'Antananarive. D'abord, il faut, on a assuré la capacité institutionnelle et structu structurelle de la task force appuyée par la base d'un texte de loi réglementaire qui est inviolable au niveau de l'Assemblée nationale à tous les niveaux de décision. Donc, il faut aussi assurer l'engagement régional de tous les élus des zones concernées euh, et la, vol la volonté politique de miser sur euh, ces axes comme axes prioritaires de développement, peu importe le changement de régime politique en considérant tous les, les plans d'urbanisme directeur et les outils de planification euh, urbain de chaque localité, mais aussi de considérer les, les projets présidentiels affectant les, les grandes villes. Donc il faut assurer la planification territoriale, la sécurisation foncière et environnementale de la filière euh, alimentation comme les, les règles et principes, les mécanismes de gestion et de l'utilisation des sols et de l'eau, d'irrigation ou de, de remblai illicite hein, qui étouffe l'agriculture urbaine actuellement. Il y a aussi les outils de gouvernance territoriale comme les, les titres verts et la, pro, la protection surtout des des zones à vocation euh, agricole. Donc il faut prendre en considération ces politiques climat en considérant bien sûr des politiques nationales déjà instaurées. Il y a la politique nationale, mais il faut aussi euh, adopter une politique locale climat adaptée à la réalité de la ville et de, des cas dé délicats comme la grande ville d'Antananarive. Nous avons aussi euh, mis en adéquation de la, la politique migratoire hein, avec euh, les entités concernées, les mobilités euh, résidentielles et la gestion de, de l'exode rural. Mais par contre, le, le souci un peu dans les, les villes africaines actuellement, euh, c'est au niveau euh, de l'insécurité et euh, il faut euh, bien co coordonner avec le ministère central de la sécurité publique et ainsi avec euh, les infrastructures liées au, au système alimentaire comme l'acheminement des produits, le transport et les, pour les consommateurs euh, finaux, etc. Il y a le, le volet euh, production qui est vraiment important euh, car c'est la base de tout produit à destination des consommateurs et d'adopter des modes euh, ces techniques de production améliorées, adaptées et surtout résilientes face au changement climatique. Euh, mais nous avons aussi assuré la qualité de production selon les besoins du marché actuel, donc pour les produits bio, les produits agroécologiques, des systèmes qui ne tuent pas le sol mais régénératifs. Donc cette politique aussi vise à, 
à mettre en corrélation avec le, le système de facilitation étatique hein, envers euh, les agriculteurs producteurs des différents intrants agricoles, des semences adaptées aux techniques modernes et même devoir ajuster les taxes sur les, les matériels agricoles. Donc, en fait, enfin, pour maximiser et de former ces producteurs-là, il faut aussi euh, un renforcement de capacité euh, pour les, les professionnels du métier, donc sur, sur les instituts supérieurs, pour, comme des, des centres de, de formation pour le, le renforcement de, de capacité. Donc sur ce système de production-là, euh, pour la ville d'Antananarive, nous avons ciblé euh, huit éléments de valeur hein, à considérer pour la production des, des filières prioritaires. Donc, selon nous, euh, nous avons axé euh, notre effort sur la filière riz, la viande porcine, le, le poulet, les tomates, euh, les poules pondeuses, les cultures maraîchères diversifiées, et les filières vaches laitières et enfin l'apiculture. Donc, ces filières prioritaires-là qui sont étalées sur un rayon de 50 km aux alentours de, de la ville d'Antananarivo hein, avec euh, cinq euh, grands axes de route nationale euh, sur les routes nationales numéro 1, 2, 3, 4 et 7. Donc, avec cette population dans ce rayon de 50 km, excédant les 5 millions d'habitants hein, qui est déjà avoisinant les, les 20% de la population totale malgache euh, producteur et, et consommateur euh, confondu. Il y a aussi le volet qu'on a mis euh, l'effort avec euh, euh, l'équipe de la FAO sur le volet euh, transformation. Comme le volet précédent, c'est vraiment important aussi parce que ça nécessite considérablement un appui du ministère central pour avoir, pour voir de près les problèmes de l'industrialisation, de, de production, des valeurs ajoutées ainsi que les techniques. Parce que de nos jours, il faut miser sur les, les transferts de, de technologies hein, avec d'autres pays comme, comme ce, c'est sur cette plateforme aujourd'hui. Donc, on aimerait bien passer un petit clin d'œil aussi à l'organisateur de nous organiser une sorte d'échange avec des visites auprès des pays ou qui sont des modèles, qui ont des modèles déjà développés sur cette filière transformation. On peut en discuter aussi sur la table ronde. Euh, il y a aussi le volet euh, acheminement, la distribution et la commercialisation. Sur ce volet, euh, l'enjeu est double. Tout d'abord, de s'assurer des infrastructures de, de distribution des produits ainsi que les techniques d'acheminement qu'on a cité tout à l'heure, mais aussi qui n'est pas la moindre, hein, le, le système de marché d'écoulement des produits dans les grandes villes. Par exemple, pour le cas d'Antananarive, nous avons des, des besoins de déplacement de marché, marché existant, mais aussi d'avoir euh, ajouté un bon nombre de marchés dans les, dans les entrées de la ville pour euh, essayer de désengorger euh, le, le trafic de la circulation lié au transport des marchandises. Et enfin, il faut euh, essayer de diversifier chaque euh, nature de marché d'écoulement pour le, le repère des consommateurs euh, sur les produits bio, produits agroécologiques ou, ou, ou autres. Mais le, le système... Euh, qu'on a mis en place avec l'équipe de la FAO aussi, c'est de la consommation. Actuellement, la politique de la ville d'Antananarive est d'assurer des produits alimentaires sains, multicolores et, et variés. Donc, une des politiques majeures, majeures du maire actuel est la vulgarisation de l'agriculture urbaine. Euh, la vulgarisation par l'installation des jardins potagers au sein des écoles primaires, des collèges, pour assurer l'alimentation quotidienne des, des enfants mais aussi d'octroyer des formations gratuites pour les foyers et ménages qui sont vraiment, qui sont très vulnérables pour cette technique et d'assurer leur sécurité alimentaire face aux, aux risques divers. Donc, beaucoup sont les, les projets mis en place pour cette technique d'agriculture urbaine que la culture de la consommation des Nariviens commence à exiger des produits de qualité. Comme actuellement, nous voulons insérer la ville d'Antana arrive dans la liste des villes créatives au sein de l'UNESCO comme une ville gastronomique. Donc, on va essayer de trouver cette tremplin-là 
pour essayer de, de, de voir et de considérer ces, ces besoins de la consommation qui, est vraiment, euh, qui, qui ont vraiment changé euh, ces derniers temps. Donc, il y a aussi euh, la gestion euh, rationnelle des déchets. Euh, actuellement, nous sommes sur le point d'élaborer euh, beaucoup de politiques, les politiques culturelles, les politiques euh, climatiques, avec les politiques genre. Mais il y a cette politique euh, durable de la gestion rationnelle des déchets, car nous avons d'abord installé euh, une mode et méthode efficace de ramassage des déchets. Mais actuellement, euh, nous sommes sur la phase d'élaboration et de sensibilisation des citoyens sur la, sur la culture des tri des déchets, avec euh, la promotion de, de la transformation des énergies euh, renouvelables. Donc, euh, c'était sur ces points que j'aimerais euh, attirer notre, euh, notre réflexion euh, pour euh, notre échange dans la table ronde actuellement, nous aimerions bien échanger sur cette expérience-là. Et euh, si vous avez des, des commentaires ou des questions, euh, nous sommes euh, là pour euh, répondre. Merci beaucoup. Merci, M. Nome. Thank you for the intervention. I think it's always great to hear from Antanarivo and I think the city has also been on this journey with us um, over the last couple of years, particularly in 2018, where we paired um, Antanarivo with the city of Arusha um, towards an exchange around um, the establishment of, of a, food, um, a food system council uh, and towards the development of the strategy, of, of a strategy for, for Arusha at the time. And it's, it's promising to see um yeah the the progress that antana has made and and i welcome um mr norma your thoughts um when we get to to the the breakout session um is to perhaps um again maybe allude to to one of two of those points where where you feel there's perhaps a need for antana Rivo to engage um and hopefully um through the participants and the other cities and partners on on the call Um, we can, we Bien can... sûr, merci beaucoup, Ryan. Yeah. Merci. Um, we're now moving from Madagascar all the way to, to Western Africa, to Senegal, um, and we'll be indulged by Madame Eda Tiam and Mr. Tierno Diop um, from SIGA, who I understand is a similar, is a similar uh, corporate or body Um, as presented by Mr. Patrick I'm from Manobri. So it's, it's a similar body to, to the flag committee. Um, but uh, Madam Eda and Mr. D uh, Tierno um, will be presenting um, or representing at least um, the commune of Bambilo as well, who is a small um, commune in West Africa, in the Senegal, um, in the country of Senegal, who's, who's sort of starting their journey on, on food system governance. And I think Um, we're delighted to have them as part of the conversation um, as a new friend and, and of course, hopefully um, to find this session um, very fruitful and to make connections with, with the likes of Antana, um, Etiquene and Nairobi um, towards, towards your, your journey on food systems governance. So welcome again um, and we look forward to your intervention. So Madam Eda, Tiam, over to you. Merci beaucoup et bonjour à tous. Je m'avais vous présenté une petite exposée sur la commune de, de Bamelor. Vous m'entendez? Allô? Yes. yes. Oui. Voilà, je vais vous faire une petite introduction <coughs> sur notre commune. La commune de Bamelor est, est une commune du Sénégal située à une trentaine de kilomètres de Dakar. Créée en 2011 comme communauté rurale, est devenue commune avec la communisation intégrale en juin 2014. Elle fait partie de l'arrondissement de Sangalkam et du département de Rupusque de la région de Dakar. Avec une population principalement agriculteur de 60 000 habitants, de 60 000 habitants cause pour laquelle une communauté d'initiative pour la gouvernance alimentaire, c'est-à-dire le SIGA, a été créée au sein de la commune. Le maire a signé l'arrêté reconnaissant le SIGA le 1er juillet 2022. 
avec l'aide de la FAO, Enda Ecopop, RNPNT. Voilà, maintenant on va vous présenter notre système alimentaire de Bambilor. En premier lieu, aperçu sur la politique alimentaire de la commune de Bambilor. Le système alimentaire territorial est principalement soutenu par le sous-secteur économique suivant. L'agriculture, l'élevage, l'agriculture, la transformation des produits locaux, la distribution, le transport, l'amélioration à l'accès au marché des produits alimentaires. Voilà. Diapo. Référence. Référence de toutes les politiques alimentaires territoriales. Plan Sénégal émergent, pilier 1, pilier 2, pilier 3. Acte 3 de la décentralisation, loi d'orientation agro-subopastorale, stratégie nationale de, de sécurité alimentaire et de résilience. Plan stratégique multisectoriel de la nutrition du Sénégal, développement de l'alimentation scolaire avec les cantines. Projet des agropoles projet des pôles urbains, mesures étatiques, c'est-à-dire le COVID-19, fonds COVID-19, programme d'intensification et éco-soutenable de l'agriculture de la zone des Niens. Conseil national de développement de la nutrition, programme d'urgence de sécurité alimentaire, secrétariat exécutif du Conseil national de la sécurité alimentaire, délégation générale de la protection sociale et de la solidarité nationale, subvention agricole, Subvention aliments bétail. Voilà. Aperçu sur les initiatives alimentaires locaux. Opération du panier de la ménagère. Projet des cantines scolaires. Organisation d'une foire agroalimentaire. Opération Wanyudara, c'est-à-dire des cuisines au sein des écoles coraniques. Des unités de transformation. Des produits locaux fonctionnent. Des kilomètres de vente de produits locaux sont installés. Contribution municipale à l'aide alimentaire COVID-19. Production d'émissions radiophoniques culinaires alimentaires. Existence de fermes laitières. Des causeries communautaires sur l'alimentation sont faites. Des unités de récupération et d'éducation nutritionnelle communautaire existent également. La solidarité alimentaire avec la mise à disposition d'appui, exemple les secours islamiques. Assistance au financement des transporteurs pour la modernisation des moyens de distribution des produits agricoles par la mairie. Mise en place d'un comité local d'initiative sur la gouvernance alimentaire, c'est-à-dire le SIGA, reconnu par l'arrêté dont je vous parlais tout à l'heure, municipal, voilà, du 1er juin 2022. Également l'élaboration d'une stratégie alimentaire et d'une charte alimentaire. Diapo. Les pratiques de gouvernance alimentaire urbaine adoptées par la commune. L'autorité locale, les acteurs territoriaux clés informés et sensibilisés sur les enjeux et les objectifs du système alimentaire territorial résilient. Cartographie des acteurs de la gouvernance alimentaire dans la commune de Bambilor. Cartographie également des acteurs et maillons de la chaîne de valeur du système alimentaire local partagé et validé dans les communes également. Un comité local multi-acteurs d'initiative sur la gouvernance alimentaire, le SIGA, est mis en place également. Il y a également le plan d'action du SIGA défini et adossé à une vision des orientations stratégiques, orientation de table ronde, participative autour du travail de diagnostic, restitution et validation du système alimentaire territorial, c'est-à-dire le SAT de Bamilor, a été effectué les enjeux, les stratégies et les actions. Renforcement de capacité des acteurs du système alimentaire territorial, les rôles les, et responsabilités de leadership, plaidoyers également ont été élaborés. L'adoption par le conseil municipal et prévision budgétaire prenant en compte les enjeux alimentaires prioritaires ont, ont, ont été également définis. Diapo. Plusieurs acteurs sont présents dans le système alimentaire de la commune de Babylone. L'État est présent à travers des ONG également, 
la commune, le conseil municipal départemental, les services techniques de l'État, les organisations de base, c'est-à-dire les producteurs, les transformateurs, le, les transporteurs, les commerçants, etc. Les organisations, les organisations fêtières, les organisations non gouvernementales, les programmes de projets également, les comités de gestion des infrastructures communautaires. Diapo. On a eu à élaborer trois principes d'innovation introduits dans, dans, nos, dans vos pratiques de gouvernance alimentaire. La mise en place d'un comité local, multi-acteur, initiative sur la gouvernance alimentaire, c'est-à-dire le SIGA, création d'une commission d'un conseil municipal chargé de l'agriculture et de la sécurité alimentaire. Il y a aussi également la création de groupes thématiques alimentaires de travail, les GTA, il y a la production, la transformation, le transport, la distribution, commercialisation, communication, l'hygiène, l'environnement, suivi et évaluation. Il y a aussi l'élaboration d'une stratégie alimentaire, l'établissement d'un plan d'action opérationnel des groupes thématiques alimentaires de travail également. Il y a aussi l'existence d'un fonds pour le financement des initiatives de développement territorial mises en place par la commune. Il y a aussi la rédaction des chartes alimentaires de Bambelor qui a été élaborée également. Diapo. Les atouts et les contraintes des pratiques de gouvernance alimentaire urbaine adoptées. Concernant les atouts, il y a l'existence d'une forte volonté politique de prise en charge des enjeux alimentaires. Il y a aussi l'existence d'une bonne dynamique organisationnelle, base, base fêtière et socio-professionnelle. Il y a aussi une forte présence d'OBS intervenant dans, les prom dans la promotion du genre. Il y a aussi la gestion des ressources naturelles, l'alimentation et la nutrition. Il y a aussi la présence des structures d'encadrement, l'accompagnement des partenaires du développement. Il y a aussi une forte intervention dans l'alimentation de la nutrition. Il y a aussi également des prédominances des organisations pécaires formelles. Concernant les contraintes, il y a l'insuffisance des acteurs de renforcement de capacités stratégiques et opérationnel. Il y a aussi l'insuffisance de connaissances techniques et ménagériales. Il y a aussi une faible connaissance de, sur les techniques de fundraising. Il y a aussi une, des difficultés d'accès au financement. Il y a aussi, il y a aussi des contraintes aussi, l'accès difficile de la terre pour les femmes. Il y a aussi une urbanisation des zones de culture. Diapo. On a eu adopté les enseignements tirés, la réussite, les leçons, les limites également. Concernant les, la réussite et les leçons, il y a eu un fort engagement des acteurs locaux grâce aux approches participatives crédibilité des acteurs institutionnels et leaders communautaires, la municipalité et le SIGA. Il y a aussi une forte attente des acteurs locaux vis-à-vis -vis du SAT et des initiatives diverses. Synergie des interventions des parties prenantes. Il y a aussi une forte implication des collectivités territoriales, la commune et département dans la mise en œuvre des initiatives locales sur l'alimentation et la nutrition. Concernant les limites, on constate une insuffisance des actions de renforcement de capacités stratégiques et opérationnelles, insuffisance de connaissances techniques et managériales. Il y, a, il y a une faible connaissance sur les techniques de fundraxine. On constate aussi des difficultés d'accès au financement. Concernant les opportunités, il y a aussi des projets de cuisine centrale à Bambilor qui, qui ont été élaborés. Euh, on a des besoins d'assistance en matière interterritoriale, intercommunalité. 
une consolidation de la synergie de gouvernance alimentaire et nutritionnelle entre le conseil départemental de Rufis et la commune de Bambilor. Il y a aussi une relation intercommunale en, constru en construction entre la commune de Kungel et, et le conseil départemental. Il y a aussi également l'engagement du, du SIGA. Voilà, euh, diapo. Euh, concernant les, 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 les perspectives, on a eu à élaborer des, les enjeux et les, les, les défis. L'instauration de mécanismes de gouvernance participative et durable du système alimentaire. L'appropriation communautaire du système de gouvernance, le renforcement et la résilience nutritionnelle des communautés et l'amélioration du cadre de, de vie le renforcement et l'implication de la collectivité territoriale, commune et département, la lutte contre les effets néfastes du changement climatique par l'amélioration et la résilience du système alimentaire et nutritionnel, le développement du système de production adosé à un bon court circuit de transformation et de la commercialisation la professionnalisation accentuée sur des unités de transformation sont basées sur la modération et le renforcement des capacités opérationnelles également. Il y a aussi le financement des activités de développement des systèmes de production alimentaire, la promotion d'une urbanisation intégrée d'un système de production agro-animal. Voilà ce qu'on a présenté concernant le système alimentaire de la commune de, de Bambilor. Euh, C'est tout pour cet exposé et je m'en vais également vous, vous présenter quelques objectifs du SIGA. Le SIGA de Bambilor, euh, c'est une organisation qu'on a eu à élaborer pour euh, épauler les populations et pour un bon fonctionnement du système alimentaire de, de, de Bambilor. Les objectifs ont été élaborés, l'amélioration du développement durable, la sécurité alimentaire, et la nutrition communautaire également. Le SIGA également a des objectifs, des objectifs spécifiques. Fédérer les synergies des différents acteurs de la chaîne alimentaire et les élus locaux. Le maire qui nous appuie personnellement et il s'est engagé pour le bon fonctionnement du programme de, du, du SIGA également. Voilà, et je vous remercie pour, pour l'écoute. C'était tout pour notre présentation au niveau de Bambilor. Si vous avez des questions et des suggestions à, à faire, merci beaucoup. Merci, Madame Ida. Merci. Again, great, great to have you join us and thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, I think I think you've presented it quite well and I think um, although there's there's good momentum um, in Bambilor, there seems to be um, a need for for some support and I, I hope is that. Um, through this continued partnership, this new partnership, um, we can at least try and, and plug some of those, those holes that you guys are experiencing. Um, and, and of course, I think today, today provides an, a, an opportunity for you to also engage and connect with, with some peers from other cities um, and partners. So we're looking forward to, to, con to working with you um, in future. I understand that we have Mr. Afflodren back. Merci. Merci, ma'am. Uh, Eric, if you can hear me and you are back, the floor yes. is yours. Sorry, you thank you. <laughs> um, I want to share my screen. Um, can they, that other screen go off? Oopsie. Oops. Uh, yeah, we should be able to share now. Uh, just one second. Just, uh, okay, share my screen. Uh, where's my screen? Uh, I need to get to the right screen. Uh, no. Sorry, I, got the, I think I got the wrong screen open there. Um, uh, sorry, I just need to get... I'm battling to get my screen open here. Uh, well, I need to open the presentation first sorry uh, yeah i think you might have to you have to share the entire window um for the presentation yes, uh, yes. Um, let me just 
go. Okay, let me just stop sharing for a minute. Just one second. Uh, I know why it's not. Let me just do that. So I'm almost there. Uh, okay. Can you see now? It's coming up. There we go. Yeah. Um, colleagues, I, I wanted to, to really talk about a process that we've started here in the city, which kind of talks to what I wanted to focus on. Um, and, you know, the, the city has de decided that uh, uh, we will work with uh, uh, our, our neighbors, uh, our neighboring municipalities, our all spheres of government, and our international partners to create what we call a, uh, a cluster, uh, local partners in the agri agriculture and agribusiness sector. So what we've done is we've brought together a number of, of, of partners to, to really help us. Um, so we, we're looking at a, a, a meeting quite soon uh, we want to bring together the stakeholders um, and we've identified. So the objectives of it really was to have an engagement with agri stakeholders uh, in, in the month of March this year. We had one and this is a follow up now. It was really to create a platform for partners involved in the agriculture and agribusiness sector to come together as a cluster lobby and advocate for support for the sector, develop a process to share knowledge. And that is where we'd really like to work with ICLI and all the partners that are participating here to include intermunicipal cooperation. Uh, to create a platform for mutual benefit and to create a platform to mobilize private and public sector and support resources for the sector, uh, propose and develop an, an innovative platform for access to markets and capital to grow the sector, include strategic partnerships with the privacy international partners. And those are like your big multinational uh, uh, stores uh, that uh, provide uh, like spa, checkers, uh, you know, your, 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 your real big supermarkets in, in the country. Uh, also to develop strategies to align all government departments and entities. And now that's one of the weaknesses sometimes in cities is that uh, a lot of things come from the top down to the cities. And we really need to shift that. Uh, you cannot have a situation where things come from the top down to the cities. There has to be some kind of genuine partnership working together. Um, and then also ideas for the sector to respond to climate change. It's very important. Uh, cities, uh, I mean, we had tragic floods in, in, in April and May this year. We lost many lives. The river system in the city transformed parts of the city and impacted on the, on, on the agriculture and agribusiness sector in a, may, in a big way. Um, so we want to really develop an inclusive and empowered agri sector or cluster to maximize food security and health nutrition for the society in the city. Um, so this is a, a program. I'm not going to go into this program too much, uh, but really the ideas we're looking at innovative ideas to grow the sector, ideas to create a working platform or, or formation to keep the connections and knowledge sharing, a potential for a more permanent market in the city. We have a number of markets and you know the city, uh, within the city system, we have a huge uh, fresh produce market that is, that is a wholesale platform for, that supplies all the, the supermarkets and uh, 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 commercial sectors in the city. And we believe because we have that facility in the city, we can have a more united and more better organized sector. Um, and then we, we want to do a summit that we, that's coming up. Um, and then just, just, just to look at the, the, the participation, some of the outcomes we want to look at is really to include the, the sector in the city's wholesale market system, ideas for resource mobilization, particularly helping the agribusiness and agriculture, both small, medium and big, to get uh, access to capital for their businesses, the agribusiness and agri, we, what we've done in the city, we have established an agribusiness and agri ecology unit that's, that provides infrastructure and support to, to, to small and medium uh, agribusinesses in the city. We've actually set up an, a chicken agribusiness. We bought a, a chicken business that was failing and we are trying to revive that to, to ensure that we can provide local chickens. Uh, the city supply, uh, we have a number of food uh, feeding schemes in the city that supply to schools and to communities. And we want to make sure that all the vegetables that the city uh, cooperatives and programs uh, we support can support those and, and that it's an income source for them. We also want to look at how does the city infrastructure 
We've got a pilot program on grey water, how we can get good quality water to our agricultural systems using the recycled water in the city system, uh, infrastructure and all uh, other forms of assistance. Uh, we also want to make sure that the participation in the agriculture and agribusiness uh, process is enhanced for small and, 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 and medium business. And lastly, and most importantly, is how do we improve the governance systems to support the sector? Because I believe that cert, uh, a lot of city, city systems are not geared in terms of their governance systems and their budgeting systems to support uh, ag the agribusiness sector in their, in their cities and in their regions. And that needs to be addressed. Um, uh, I'd like to stop there, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Short and sweet, as always. Um, and I think I think my, I speak on behalf of I think the partners around the table to say that we quite we would be quite committed to, to form part of this um, of this initiative by the city. Um, and we'd like to to learn more. I think um, you've sort of brought us back back onto 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 time for our session. Um, but perhaps um, yeah, in a, in a separate engagement, we can we can look into 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 what what the partnership on that initiative. Um, actually looks like. So thank you for that for that um, initiative and for availing yourself um, again to, to join us. Um, we, we're looking good for time um, and we're getting into dessert now. I think we're all, we're all quite full um, from the starter and the main course. I think now we'd like maybe a little something a bit more sweeter. Um, I can't promise that it's going to be that way. Um, but what I do want to maybe just propose is for all of our speakers and panelists, um, if you could indulge me by switching on your videos. Um, we have a couple of premeditated questions for this session, but I thought to perhaps open it up to, to the floor, to the audience, um, and perhaps take one or two live questions um, addressed to the panel. Um, and then hopefully we can um, spark some engagement there. Um, or maybe to take a step back and to, to ask our panelists um, on the back of, of those interventions, um, is there anything that, that sort of stood out for you? Um, anything that, you, that, you, that inspired you, particularly something that you maybe want to, to follow up on? Um, I think there was a lot of similarities, for example, between the cities, for example, in the approaches, um, but also some, some good lessons there to to take away. So maybe maybe before I open it up to the floor um, and a note to the participants, if you do have a question that you feel you want to pose to the panel, please do raise your hand and we will um, indulge you. But maybe before um, we allow the, the participants to participate, maybe anything from the panel, um, from our presenters um, at this stage, any any sort of immediate comments or feedback um, before, before I let the participants get on you. Yeah, Ray, how Patrick. are you? Very well. Sir. Yes, uh, that was a very rich uh, a mix from uh, all of us. And uh, it uh, actually gives us even an incentive to see how others have, uh, uh, have been able to go through their food systems and what they see and what challenges that they go through. And uh, the key uh, thing that I bring out that I see in this issue is that uh, uh, we are having stakeholders, partners, and there is need for engaging the national government as well as the county government or the municipal government, whichever the case might be. Thank you. Absolutely, and I think I think Paul Paul mentioned in his opening address this morning that that, that engagement, those waters, still seems a bit murky in terms of 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 what that that engagement um, between spheres of government actually looks like. Um, so that's a, that's a point well made. I'm not sure if there's, if there's a response from the floor. Um, Eric, I see you have your hand raised. Please, please do. Go yeah. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks, colleagues. You know, one of the things uh, what we've been doing in, in, in South Africa and in our city, uh, our national government has instituted a program called the District Development Model. Uh, it's a model that really forces all spheres of government, national, regional, and city level to work together. And it's called the one budget, one plan. And where all spheres of government mustn't budget in separate compartments. There has to be a way. And in that budgeting planning, 
I think this whole issue of agriculture, local government sustainability, in particular around food security, needs to be on that agenda. You know, you, you, you can't have national government planning for a city without the mayor and the city planning people giving input into that and being part of that process. Because I think there's a definite disjuncture between the national and the region um, and cities. Uh, and, and in our case, I mean, in, in the colleagues that I see around here, the city I'm talking about is a metro, it's a metropolitan. Big city of 4 million people, but it actually is 68% rural. And the, uh, the agricultural potential is underutilized. That's my opinion. So I think the district development model, I think going forward with this partnership with ICLI and the partners here, we would like to, to you can have a watching brief to see if there's anything you'd like to learn from this district development model. And agriculture and agribusiness and agri-processing is part of that agenda. Thank you. Great. Any, any comments, insights to that? Mr. Diop, do you want to share? Mr. Tiorno? Well, we just support it. Well, bonjour. Hello, je passe. Please proceed. Voilà, donc, euh, juste pour préciser qu'au niveau de Bambilor, nous sommes dans la salle de la mairie et nous sommes avec des membres de, du comité d'initiative. Je voudrais très rapidement, hein, très rapidement, si vous le permettez, euh, vous dire que nous avons Amadou Ben qui est un producteur, nous avons Nelly, madame, qui est la présidente du groupe thématique alimentaire commercialisation. Nous avons M. Andoui, qui est le président du comité de gestion du jardin agroécologique. Nous avons M. Salou Diop, il est le secrétaire général du SIGA et le point focal de la mairie dans le comité. Également, il est expert en halle et marché. Et nous travaillons avec lui euh, avec, euh, dans le cadre du partenariat avec euh, Ricolto. Il y a M. Birambe, qui vit en Italie, à Bambelor, qui est producteur. Et je suis heureux de voir également, nous avons des, des Bambulorois qui sont en ligne. J'ai vu euh, que Mme Aïssa Diallo, qui est membre du groupe thématique alimentaire Transformation. Bonaventure Djemé également, qui est membre du groupe thématique euh, Hygiène, Environnement, Consommation. Alors, c'était juste pour faire ce... Mais également, dire tout simplement que tout ce qui a été fait, tout ce qui a été ébauché à Bambulor, L'a été grâce, n'est-ce pas, à la collaboration de la FAO qui a mis à nos disposition des experts pour toutes les capacités organisationnelles. Il y a Sicodev pour le jardin et l'alimentation saine. Il y a eu euh, euh, Enda Ecopop pour la capacitation administrative. Il y a eu le PAED pour la gestion des marchés. Donc, toute une chaîne, n'est-ce pas, d'ONG de, 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 que la FAO a mis à la disposition de. Du comité. Et pour finir, je voudrais euh, dire un peu par rapport à la à Monsieur Nom d'Antananarivo, vraiment le système alimentaire nous a séduit. Nous avons un peu le même schéma, mais seulement eux, ils sont dans la phase active, alors que nous, nous sommes vraiment en phase de préparation. Donc, je crois que ce serait intéressant de. Nous allons garder le contact avec Antananarivo et voir, n'est-ce pas, comment travailler dans ce cadre-là. J'ai beaucoup aimé, n'est-ce pas, le système alimentaire. Voilà, l'autre également a parlé de... Euh, je ne sais pas si on aura l'occasion de revenir sur... Euh, lors de la table ronde ou sur les présentations des maires, des villes. Vous pensez qu'on peut... Euh, par exemple, il a parlé de... programme national... Tout à l'heure, il disait que les programmes nationaux n'arrangent pas, enfin, c'est un peu ça, hein, ne collent pas avec les réalités locales. Le programme, nous avons dit, et nous travaillons dans ce sens, que la gouvernance multiniveau est quelque chose que nous devons développer. Il ne sert à rien, n'est-ce pas, de prendre des initiatives au niveau local et que cela ne soit pas, n'est-ce pas, pris, ni en, euh, pris en, en compte par le niveau national. Donc, lorsqu'on a parlé de cette euh, gouvernance transversale, nous avons pensé qu'elle est fondamentale. Qu est fondamentale. Je crois que nous allons y revenir. 
C'est pourquoi, d'ailleurs, lors des laboratoires sur le système alimentaire avec ICLEI, nous mettons beaucoup d'espoir sur ce laboratoire. Il nous faut créer ce link entre le niveau local et le niveau national. C'est vrai, l'État a ses politiques, mais est-ce que ces politiques arrangent la commune de Bambidor Est-ce qu'elle prend en compte les réalités de la commune de Bambidor D'où la nécessité vraiment de faire monter nos initiatives vers le sommet. Voilà, c'est tout. Je crois qu'on reviendra un peu plus sur le aspect. Également, au, si également, on reviendra sur notre charte. Nous avons finalement fini d'élaborer notre charte alimentaire de Bangalore. Et toutes nos initiatives vont reposer n'est-ce pas sur cette charte -là, que nous pourrons partager ultérieurement. Voilà, merci. Merci, Mr. Tiolo. I mean, we look forward to, to receiving details on the chart and, of course, um, to continue the partnership with, with Pambilo. Um, and I'm just wondering on, on Mr. Tiolo's point, um, Gareth, I'm not sure if it was addressed to you, just that this juncture, I guess, between um, national policy and, and what happens on the ground. And I'm not sure if you maybe just want to share um, one or two lines on that. Thank you. And I, yeah, I, I'm sure there are many who want to ask some other questions or challenge some of the things that have been said. So, but I th it's just that, and I think this is the question that I wanted to offer as a provocation is how do, as cities, you know, the African City Food Month, how do we engage in the context? How do we engage also to Eric's point, you know, around the district? How do we, how do we understand the authority at a particular governance level around how and what decisions can be made in that particular space? and how are those decisions enabled? And so, yeah, the district might be great. And uh, Itukweni is a particular example where it is largely rural, but how are there other areas where people have to make decisions about a very specific context? And so how does that fit within what I argued in my position was a, a, a sort of national government imperative and a focus that I want to just ask the question, is that out of step? with the current urban transition that Africa is seeing and the challenges that many city governments are facing around food security, not just as food as production, but across all those dimensions of food security. So just really restating my point, but I'll leave it to the questions that I see coming in. Great, thanks, Gareth. And I see, I see there's a hand from, from Anne Jones. Um, and you're welcome to unmute and go ahead. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone, and hello to my colleague, Abe, who spoke earlier from GAIN, um, and to Jane Battersby, who is on the Urban Food Systems Working Group with, with GAIN as well, and FAL. Um, so really very interesting intersections, and this is what um, the Coalition on Sustainable and Inclusive Urban Food Systems has recognized, um, noting that obviously cities are not islands. They are in some way connected somewhere along the line to their rural counterparts. Um, is that cities and national governments are not talking together well. And how do we do that? Um, and so the coalition is focused on supporting both cities and national governments and coming together around capacitation, how to communicate better about something that is a very systems-based kind of thing. It's not like energy. I mean, as we saw in the AfriCities uh, Kisimo event, everything was divvied up into infrastructure, energy, wash. We didn't really see food coming out as a systemic uh, consideration. Um, so capacitation, access to finance and monitoring and evaluation. So please reach out. ICLEA is actually supporting uh, FAO and GAIN on that as well. Um, the other one is uh, the public budget, which has come out. And obviously different um, countries have different governance systems. Um, and the budget is often seen as the vehicle in which policy is delivered. And there's an enormous amount of emphasis because cities obviously get the, the, the smaller share of that and they have to get the money elsewhere. And there is always going to be too great a demand as we have accelerated urbanization, we have changing demographics, we have climate change and all these other multiplier effects coming on board. So there's an urgency, but also there's a, a scale issue. Um, and the mobilization of the everyday people is really important in this. Um, and city governments, I think, have an important role. Instead of trying to do it all themselves, it's about sending those signaling signals out. I heard somebody talking, I think, in Durban about the wholesale market. Markets for us are a very important intersection of the informal food sector, 
and the formal food sector. And those are the places where people communicate. They learn about their food. They learn about nutrition. So for us, it's not just food systems transformation for the planet. It's also for healthy diets for people and planet. So that's where, where our goal is. So how can we harness these, these institutions, these um, relationships that are already existing? Um, I think what's really important is that in the absence of governance, please understand the informal sector is highly governed. They have their own kinds of governance. We need to better harness that, better connect with that, better talk to nonprofits, other nonprofits, um, other uh, business sectors that are in our space and say, maybe you don't come on board with everything we're doing, but let's coordinate and align where we can so that we can increase our reachability beyond kind of the public budget. So I think that's enough from me. Thanks. Thanks, and very important points. Um, and I think there's there's a couple in agreement. Um, I think Eric, you you shared your approval in the chat as well. So thank you for those interventions, Anne. Um, actually, there's a couple more hands raised. Uh, I think Roger, you had your hand up first, so we'll go to Roger, um, and then we'll go to Mr. Kimera Henry. Roger, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. Um, I think these all these questions are, are, are very provocative or, or thought provoking. And from a national point of view, um, I, I, I'm taking a lot of notes. But I am not from the, the, the private sector or from an organization. I'm from national government. And as a government employee, the question is always, what are the services I need to deliver? Now, different countries have different um, governance systems. And I think that is very critical to understand. So South Africa is governed by its constitution and its local municipalities, district municipality, provincial governments, and its national government. There is clear direction on what needs to happen. And, 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 and I think the questions are very, very important, um, especially our colleague from, from the UCT that asks us, but how about if we first implement what is in our laws? Um, this is just as, 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 because I'm not trying to defend because I'm, 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 I'm simply looking has what we have put down in our laws been fully exploited in terms of implementation and the way we work together. So my colleague has already spoken about um, um, the, what the DDM or the district development model. And that is a, 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 clear, a clear implementation program where it says that all three um, spheres of government, which is um, national, local, and provincial need to actually sit together. Your programs, um, so we used to have, or we have IDPs, integrated development programs, but national government cannot force um, local government put, to put agriculture into, into its plan. All that we do is we use intergovernmental systems and, we are, and that is another policy and a law that we have in South Africa, but do we follow it? So. If you identify agriculture, um, so you have a city like the one that I'm sitting in, city of Tswane, was actually said, no, agriculture is very critical to us. So they've got actually got a dedicated um, department within the municipality that just deals with, with agriculture. So they have a director for agriculture. They employed agriculturalists. So, so it is not necessarily saying what is the governance system because even if you have it at a local level, it, it needs to follow or flow up into a national point of view. So, so for South Africa, um, and, 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 and I know this has been widely criticized, um, we always say that we're at the national level, we are food secure, but at the household level. So for us, there's a clear disaggregation. So we know where the problem is. The problem is not at the national level. The problem is at the household level. And who are the, 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 the people dependent and to need to deliver the services? So I think that is the one question. But but outside of that, I think the the the, the especially the colleague from, from, from UCT, he has a very, very, a very good perception. And I'm not sure if like in the South African term, I see South Africans we like using um, the FAO definition, forgetting that in 2014 we've got an approved um, policy on food and nutrition security. And we don't just say food security and nutrition, we talk about food and nutrition security. Um, South Africa, we um, somehow, maize is our, uh, is our staple crop, but we biofortify 
because we know white maize has no nutritional value. But because the majority of the country is eating, we actually biofortify um, these foods. We actually have now a new national program that we're pushing on biofortification. And, but I do think some of the other systems in the other countries that I've heard is, is very interesting. And even from our local colleagues. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing, um, if I can use that word, um, I'm not being corrupt now, and I'm stealing for the betterment of the country and for the national policies. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I want to I want to ask you this response. Um, maybe before I hand over to Mr. Kimera, um, if there's any response or follow up or question to to what Roger has just um, alluded to. Um, so, so sorry, I, 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 really, I, I re recommend that, and I really take his point, and I think a national government cannot force cities to have agriculture in the agenda, but I think maybe some kind of diplomatic or, or, or what's the word, taking people on a journey that they, is in their best interest, that all cities, whether you're small or big, have a, an agriculture and food security focus. And I think maybe ICLI can help lobby for that. Thanks. Absolutely. I think it also speaks to, to that uncertainty around mandates, I think, at the local um, and sub-national level. Um, and I think, yeah, there's definitely a, an opportunity for, for us as ICLI and others to, to participate. So, um, Gareth Obey, I'm not sure if it's a re in response to Roger. Um, otherwise, I would like to maybe give Mr. Kamera an opportunity and then, um, Gareth, I'll come to you and then Obey. Mr. Kamera, Henry? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the discourse. It has been rich sharing from cities, but I'll switch off my camera for stability of the internet. Uh, having said that, and I would like to pick up from Roger, I think this comes in on a case by case by given the countries, uh, a national government can provide guidance as policy guidance and if agriculture is a priority, then local governments will need to take that on because it's an obligation as a duty bearer government to make sure that citizens do have something to eat and that is of good quality. So having listened in to all of the submissions and uh, we're aligned, aligned with, the, with the theme of uh, nourishing our cities towards recovery, I find that uh, all the cities presenting uh, an element might have been alluded to, but to realize all this and have enough food and healthy citizens, the element of food safety was being nibbled on and not clearly coming out. And uh, with all the experience, Hello, is it, is it just on my side in or did we do? Oh. It is provided and in which it is dispersed is something very key. And uh, I, 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 it is good that uh, a number of colleagues uh, have talked about the food loss on West, which is something also very important to facilitate. But the other aspect that I thought and a lot of emphasis uh, our colleague has put it in the chat, the capacities of local governments, because these are the implementers, whether the policy comes in from the central government or these are the foot soldiers of the whole food system, where the inspection will take place, where the, uh, the, the surveillance, where the nutritional levels will be done, at the local government, but do they have the capacities and are, are the local government officials in position to bring together the different stakeholders? And you'll find that are the local government in position to license quality infrastructure from which our food, as the consumers will receive, is processed, is dispensed, are the markets, the sources of food. This is where I find that uh, 
there is a quite a great need of deliberations to build the capacities to make sure that the benefits of sustainable food systems are realized at the local government. They will play a major role. That's my general comment from a consumer perspective that will provide quality, safe, accessible and affordable food at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamera. I think we, we're definitely on the same page. Um, as Italy, we feel strongly about sustainability across the board. That's where the rubber is the road, as we like to call it, at the, at the local level. So I think um, that is definitely the reality. But yeah, of course, those those sort of lines are still, I think, still murky. And um, that's why these conversations are so important. So um, Gareth, I'll hand over to, to Gareth and then Obey. So thanks. Uh, thanks, Ryan. And thanks for, for all the comments. And I, I want to avoid being overly parochial here and only speaking to the Cyprus context. And I think we had some inputs from there. But I think in general, what I would like to stress, and perhaps this didn't come across in my, my, my input, was that I'm not saying that cities mustn't do certain things and, uh, and what have you. I think for me, it's about asking how do we open up the conversation around what is food and nutrition security? In the conversations, <clears throat> in the chat, etc., there is this predominance again around production, urban agriculture and all of this. I'm not saying that's wrong. It has to be part of this and it has to be part of the wider system. But I think it's about saying, what are the mandates of local government? There are, and Roger, not to challenge yourself directly, yes, the constitution states what we have to do. Um, whether it's a law or it's a sort of guidance document is another question, but equally in the constitution schedules four and five of the South African constitution, like with the Kenyan constitution and others, articulate explicit roles that national government plays, but equally what other spheres of government play, but equally what urban government play and their roles. And if you then insert a food lens into that and start to say, all right, so what does management of waste in a food system perspective mean? What does nutrition, what is school feeding, what is education, what does health, what does nutrition, all of these mean that are within the mandates of local government. What you see then is a very different view of food systems governance and transversal governance in an urban space. So this isn't saying we mustn't grow food or we mustn't let national government dictate us what happens. It's saying how, given the high levels of food insecurity and the real challenge, how do we activate the mandates that we hold at this point in time to apply to food? And how do we use those to actually say food is central to what we do? And I think, and the point is taken when we consider food and nutrition security in, 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 as a definition, then what is the obligation of local government, of cities in responding to these challenges? Cities manage markets, cities manage waste, cities manage access to sanitation and infrastructure. All of these enable or constrain a, a food and nutrition outcome for many urban residents. So I, for me, it's about how do we say what is the role that cities can play? And that is a different role and the point I wanted to make. It's a different role to national government in terms of how it does, but that role needs to be expanded significantly. And we do need fiscal kind of support to enable that, but cities have a critical role to play in the food system. And it's not just about growing food. And, and I do, my real concern is that we relegate the hungry and the, those that have insecure access to food and nutrition to say, okay, go out and grow your own food because they are spending most of their trying, trying to earn livelihoods and work and trying to ensure nutrition for their children. And is it right to defer that responsibility back on them when it is the responsibility of the state, not just national, but urban, district, county, provincial, and national governments to actually enable the well-being of our citizens. And so what then is the governance mandate across both hierarchical and horizontal governance structures to enable those things to become a reality. And yeah, I, I suppose I, my question, my, my frustration is that we seem to be going right back to kind of growing food and, and, and mandatism where there are these mandates right the way through the various different tiers of government that would enable a far more proactive response to how food and nutrition is enabled in cities. I'll stop. Great, thanks. Thanks, Gareth. Um, just to mention, ladies and gentlemen, that we 
we will probably run slightly over time, um, but not to worry, the session won't won't abruptly come to, to a close. So if you are engaged in the conversation and you are willing to stay on a bit longer, um, please do feel free. Um, Mr. Obey? No, thank you very much. I think uh, the discussion has really been good and rich. Um, I just wanted to comment on something which has been occurring and recurring on the linkages between really um, sub-national where a city may be and the national government. From where I'm sitting, the experience is, of course, most of the countries, the national policy, national uh, level make national policies. But to me, it's in, in consultative ways with different stakeholders. But it cannot reach everybody. So um, it reaches maybe the uh, umbrella organization or organization which represents some interest in making policy to get the ideas. So I'm seeing the platform, at sectoral platform we are talking about within the city as a really uh, important uh, um, um, platform to try to, uh, to, na uh, to narrow that gap which exists by them, you know, coming out with ideas where it's representing the people they are together there to, to give the ideas of the you know, policy making, but also support the implementation at local level and generating evidence, which make even these local communities or local uh, cities to, you know, to push the agenda of the, what, whatever we are talking about and food security and act in systemic way. So, for example, what we found during the dialogue, the Arusha um, a Sustainable Food System Platform generated the evidence of the safety, food safety issues. And the city took it over and, you know, on the consumer awareness on how to detect the, 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 the germs in the food and so on. And now they are pushing on how the city can come up with bylaws which really um, guide the food uh, safety within the city as a part of the uh, food ecosystem. So I think the platform can really be uh, good linkages uh, in that way. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Bay, and thank you, everyone. Um, I see we've lost a couple of people as we've run out of time. Um, I know there's also been a couple of questions that was posed in the chat to specific speakers, and, and I can assure that, we, that they won't get lost. Um, the recording of this um, session will, of course, be made available to all that those that have registered um, and will ensure that the presentations um, are captured in them as well. I see there's a number of people sharing contact details in the chat. We'll make sure to capture those um, and the questions and direct them perhaps to who they were intended to. Um, but um, in the interest of not wasting any more time, I think this has been a really fruitful discussion. I think we always feel after these sessions that we had too little time. Um, there's been so much that we wanted to discuss that we perhaps didn't get to. Um, but but I think Africa City Food Month, at least as a platform, um, is going to be here for years to come. And I think um, at us as Italy, we're obviously committed to this work. And I think one thing that has stood out for me during this session is um, that there's the real need um, to really clear those lines between um, all the actors involved in the government governance of our food systems. Um, you know, whether or not that is national government um, providing direction um, and local district and sub-national level government being being tasked with the implementation of these of these strategies. I think um, you know there's real opportunity there for us to ensure um, through this alignment of the various actors and through this this task um, or element of multi-level governance that that we can ensure that our food systems, um, at least for our cities across Africa, um, are sustainable um, and resilient um, going forward. So again, thank you everyone for, for engaging us. Um, thank you for participating. And, and again, I do apologize if we did not get to your question or your comment, um, but I can assure you there will be um, follow up and we look forward to engaging with you and having you as part of our discussions going forward. So very um, big thank you again. And just a reminder that Africa City Food Month um, is not ending today. There's another close out high level um, event happening on the 28th of July. So next week, um, Thursday at Eve. So please um, do look out for the details around that um, engagement. I think one of my colleagues will pop the, the, the details of that into the chat. 
Um, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning, please do engage with us um, through our website or by getting um, into contact with us directly. We value um, your participation and, and, and working in partnership with all of our cities and our partners. So with those few words, very, very big thank you to our panelists for indulging us today. Um, and we look forward to, to future engagements as well. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Enjoy the rest of Africa City Food Month. Um, go well um, and goodbye. Thank you for the participation. Thank you very much. Very much. Merci à vous. Merci. Au revoir à tout le monde. À très bientôt. Thanks, everyone.